Hello friends, I hope you're doing well. As you can see, I'm in a hotel room because Tom and I are still traveling. We were in Thailand, Malaysia, currently in Singapore, and we're departing tonight. But I wanted to talk about a scripture. And this scripture has been thrown about furiously and loosely, especially today in light of the recent conflicts in the Levant. How many times have you heard a minister or a believer claim that God will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. And this has become so commonly uttered that it's assumed to be scriptural truth. But if you revert to the scriptures, particularly using translations such as the KJV, the Septuagint, the Douay Rheims Bible, which are going to give you a much more accurate translation, you will not be able to find this statement in the entire text of the Bible. And yet we hear it all the time because it comes from the twisting of scripture, twisting the promise given in the singular, not the plural. The KJV translation of Genesis 12, 3 reads, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that cursed thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. The Septuagint translation reads, And I will bless those that bless thee, and curse those that curse thee, and in thee shall all the tribes of the earth be blessed. It was spoken to Abraham, alone and to his seed that is Christ. And the Apostle Paul confirms this interpretation in Galatians. Yet in the modern day, this very verse has been twisted to suggest that this promise was given to all of the nation of Israel, including a corrupt government. So how did this happen, this misinterpretation? If you look at the more recent translations of the Bible and the differing translations available, you see that the scripture has been slightly changed in terms of the pronouns used. Due to the shift to modern English, you'll notice that the more current translations of the Bible have replaced the word the with you. And so the very precise nature of this promise is lost in translation. But that change of a single pronoun can make a vast difference in one's understanding. Yes, pronouns have always been important, even in olden times, when the English language used had greater precision. For example, with the use of words like the, thou, you, ye. In Jacobian English, the words thou, the, thy, thine, were strictly used in the singular. As for the words you, or yours, it was used to reference the plural. And so the scripture uses the word thee because it is making clear that this is not referencing a group of people. Let's look at what is deemed as one of the more accurate translations of scripture. In this case, the KJV. Genesis 12, 3 states, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. The language of the King James Version of the Bible was a form of High English. It was known as Jacobian English. The pronoun used here is not you, but thee. So in the modern day language, modern day English, the word you can refer to both an individual or a group of people. In Jacobian English, the word was used to refer to the plural, to a multitude or a group of people. Meanwhile, the word the was more precise. It was only used in the 
singular, which means there was a clear delineation, a precision in the use of the word the. The was used when a statement was being directed to one single person, not to a group. The use of the pronoun the is done deliberately to deny any possibility of misreading this as applying to more than one person. So simply speaking, the word the is used to emphasize that this statement is being given to one person, to one, only one individual. In the writing of Genesis 12, 3, the writer did not use you but specifically used the because this distinction is being made here and it's necessary in order to prevent confusion. The promise of blessings upon Abraham is being made specifically to him. And yet it says, all the families of the entire earth will be blessed. This verse is speaking of all families including the Gentiles, Jewish, Gentile, all families of the earth will be blessed. So how do we explain the use of the word the in the singular directed to Abraham and the fact that through him, all families, Jew and Gentile, are going to be blessed? The answer is given in both Genesis 22 and Galatians 3.16. Let's read Genesis 22, 16 to 18. And said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. The answer is found in the use of the word seed, also used in the singular. And this is so important. It's the key because it's, again, pointing to one specific seed, one individual person, and that is Christ. Thou hast obeyed my voice. Abraham, the individual, is being blessed because he, as an individual, obeyed the voice of God. Obedience is essential to receiving the blessings of God. The blessings of God are always conditional on obedience. Isaiah 119, If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. The Apostle Paul clarifies this view in Galatians 3.16 Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. The Apostle Paul is here emphasizing the singular nature of this promise. He had to emphasize it. He had to clarify that this was not a promise given to the multitude of Abraham's physical descendants. This promise was not made to many, but to one. Hence the use of the word the in Genesis 12.3. The pronouncement was made specific, specifically to Abraham, the individual, and to his seed, that is Christ. It is unbiblical to deem the nation of Israel chosen irregardless of their obedience to the Lord, irregardless of the sin in their lives, irregardless of having idols, living in lust or fornication. Look at the state of affairs today. Tel Aviv is the LGBTQ capital of the world. 
Tel Aviv, Israel is also the abortion capital of the world. And the scripture tells us you will know them by their fruit. The modern day nation of Israel is a secular nation. Many of Israel's key leaders and founders, they were atheists who did not even believe in God. Would God make a covenant with atheists who don't even believe in him? Blessings from God are always contingent on obedience and surrender and faith in him. The biblical patriarchs and matriarchs are an example of this. Abraham himself, the father of faith, he trusted in God's promises, even in the face of the greatest tests. Abraham left his home. He left everything he knew to venture into the wilderness on the command of the Lord. He was even willing to slay his own beloved son. Why? Because he knew God was good. He knew it was wise to obey God. And so he chose to do so even when he was asked to give up his precious child. Abraham had faith in God's gracious nature and his unseen hand. And therefore, the scriptures tell us that the righteous live by faith. And God bestowed the particular blessing mentioned in Genesis 12, 3 to Abraham and Abraham alone based on his faith, based on his obedience. The scripture is not saying that God is unconditionally going to bless his physical descendants and he's certainly not going to bless any human being unconditionally simply based on bloodlines because again holiness and obedience is key let's look at king ahab a descendant of abraham in terms of ethnicity you could call him a pure jew yet ahab was so evil and so wicked that the lord took his life and even wiped out every single one of his descendants so that none remained and no trace of ahab's lineage could continue we see this in second kings that jehu had all the 70 sons of ahab king ahab slaughtered and their heads placed in baskets second kings 10 11 states so Jehu slew all that remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel and all his great men and his kinsfolks and his priests until he left him none remaining. Did King Ahab's ethnicity as a Jew, the king of Israel, grant him any favors? Clearly not. Were those who blessed King Ahab blessed? Were those who cursed Ahab cursed? What about the prophet Elijah? The prophet Elijah pronounced a curse on King Ahab. In 1 Kings 21, 19, Elijah stated that Ahab would lose his life and that the dogs would lick his blood. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession, and thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. King Ahab and Queen Jezebel were both guilty of stealing Naboth's land and killing Naboth, and there was a consequence for it. King Ahab standing as a king, his ethnicity would not wipe out his evil deeds. So again, I pose this question, was Elijah cursed? No, in fact, the opposite was true because Elijah was blessed for obediently releasing this curse based on the command of the Lord. And consider this, if there was a teacher prophet or priest living in King Ahab's time, teaching that despite the king's evil actions, he was still in covenant with God. He was still blessed by God due to his ethnicity. 
a descendant of Abraham. Therefore, one should always stand with the evil king, stand with Israel by standing with its corrupt king, Ahab. That person would be pronounced a heretic. The ancient Israelites held to a strict allegiance of God's laws in order to remain sealed, protected, and blessed by God. Anyone teaching that obedience wasn't necessary, that bloodlines are all that suffice, would be regarded as one who had no knowledge of God's ways, someone unfit to teach and lead others. But this is what churches are teaching today. There are churches and ministries teaching that no matter what Israel does, no matter how evil they are, stand with Israel, stand with its wicked leaders. They don't call them wicked, but they know they're wicked. I've even heard ministers say, no matter how naughty Israel is, they stand with Israel. I don't know how anyone can call the merciless genocide of innocent civilians in Palestine naughty. But I've actually heard this said. I've heard it said so casually, as though the lives of the Palestinians are not precious to God. Look at the prophets of Baal who declared Ahab and Jezebel blessed and supported all they did. Why? Simply because they were the rulers of Israel. Imagine Elijah's expression, his absolute abhorrence for the stance. When he had to deal with these prophets who were calling evil good, a true servant of the Lord will hold those who do evil accountable for their actions, especially evil kings who exert their authority and rule over a nation a nation that is supposedly yoked with God and dedicated to Him. Let's talk about dispensationalism. It's a movement in theology that began in the 1800s and gained a strong following in the 1900s. Preachers such as John Nelson Darby taught that God had two purposes, one for the church and one for national Israel. Bear in mind that the early church did not embrace such teachings. They did not teach that God had two covenants at once. What we are seeing today is an idea that developed through more modern interpretations of scripture developed in the 1800s due to the likes of teachers such as John Nelson Darby and Cyrus Schofield. And if you study their history and their past, it's very questionable. Due to the teaching of these men and others that Genesis 12.3 was perverted to be a blanket statement over the nation of Israel. And it has become such a common slogan, but it has no biblical foundation. It was not taught prior to the 1800s. The early church did not teach that those who bless the nation of Israel will be blessed and those who curse the nation of Israel will be cursed. This is a false teaching that entered the church in more modern times. This teaching led to an idea that there are two covenants operating today. One covenant for the church and one covenant remains for ethnic Israel. God has only ever had one bride and he has only ever had one covenant which is akin to a marriage covenant those who rejected his messiah rejected this covenant the jews who rejected their messiah are no longer his bride and so they are no longer privy to the blessings that come tied with a covenant with god think of it this way they cannot claim the blessings of a marriage covenant that they have been divorced from. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth.